Hello everybody and welcome to Commodity Culture where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day and before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. And today on the show we have a returning guest. It's the Chief Investment Officer and Founder of Bison Interests. We're going to talk oil, we're going to talk gas, we're going to talk fossil fuels. Mr. Josh Young, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So let's get started with a general update on the oil and gas market, because since our last interview, a lot has transpired, obviously. People are concerned right now, especially because of the price drop. We've been hovering around the $80 level for WTI crude over the course of the year, and now we've dropped down into the low 60s. Could you maybe give us some context on that? Is this just a blip in the radar? Is it something you see as a more persistent issue and um how do you see the oil and gas sector performing for the rest of 2023 so i like to joke that my short-term crystal ball is broken so i don't know um what i know is that the price of oil has fallen this year so far along with the net speculative interest in oil futures contracts and that there's been a very high correlation between that change in outstanding futures contracts held by non-industry, uh, sort of non-commercial uh, participants um, with the price of oil. There's an unusually high correlation. So um, what I can say is that that correlation is high enough that there's an argument for causation, which may be that speculative interest may actually be affecting the price of oil to an unusual amount. And then I can also say that global oil inventories have fallen materially. And so um, it looks like fundamentally things are on track despite terrible headlines and all this fear and, you know, just negativity. Um, and so here we're in this weird situation where the price is down a lot. Um, there's this weird, super high correlation with oil futures, speculative interest, and inventories are falling, which tells you that there's been more demand than supply so far this year. And again, lots of noise, but then there's just those real simple realities. Yeah, I like that, focusing on the actual long-term picture as opposed to getting caught up in the day-to-day -day noise. I think a lot of people face that issue in a lot of sectors. I want to talk about uh, flights in China. This is one thing you've been tracking as a bullish indicator for oil demand, and you've noted they're up 281% year over year. I believe this is domestic flights near seasonal all-time highs. How much a factor is this for oil demand and oil prices? And could you maybe also touch on the other factors surrounding the reopening of China that impact oil demand? Yeah. So, so there was actually, there was a really weird Financial Times article that came out in the last day or so that was addressing this that claimed that Chinese flights were actually still way below their COVID, their pre-COVID levels. And this was strange because from multiple other sources, whether it's Bloomberg or uh, Radar Tracker or Portia, uh, which are each, it looks like getting their own sort of independent data. I'm not sure about Bloomberg, but the other two, um, you know, were actually pretty close to uh, pre-COVID levels, except for international flights where we're at sort of two thirds of that level. But Financial Times was showing something like only 20% of the level uh, versus uh, pre-COVID for international flights. So just to highlight, you know, there is some confusion apparently. I'm, I'm interested in how they measure that because the uh, sources that I'm aware of that people use uh, are showing something quite different. So again, it's one of these weird things where these like negative headlines, you see data coming out of nowhere, you see um, analytics firms coming out of nowhere that people are like, oh, this is the best thing. And it's like, well, okay, that's nice. I'll also use the EIA numbers and like these three groups that have been satellite tracking and whatever tracking for forever. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll use these things that, you know, you can calibrate with some, you know, historical tracking error. Um, so uh, long, long answer, but the short is um, flights are recovering. Demand is up huge from mobility in China. Demand is down from lower manufacturing and construction activity than pre-COVID activity. Um, but it's still up a little from last year where we actually were locked down. I think at this point last year, China was locked down, or at least it was uh, as of a couple of weeks ago. And so I think people forget that. And so you were at sort of a 13 or so million barrel a day demand level while those big lockdowns were happening in China. And 
The average for last year, I think, was sort of 14 and a half or 15 million barrels a day. But, you know, there were these moments where we were down to 13. And it looks like right now, again, depending on how you track it and how many natural gas liquids and sort of other petroleum-like products you include, uh, we're somewhere in that 15 to 16 million barrel a day uh, demand number. So, you know, two to three million barrels a day up from this time last year. And, you know, it looks like about a million barrels a day up in aggregate from the average level from last year. So are things going great in China? No, they're going terrible. The Chinese sort of setup is cracking. I don't think they'll let it break. I think they still have enough. They have a lot of dry powder at the central bank level and the sort of federal level. They put a lot of their debt intelligently at the local level. So the local uh, municipalities are in trouble because land prices are falling and land sales are falling and that's where a lot of their money was from. And the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, have a lot of debt and they're sort of struggling. But the sort of federal government, essentially, the central government in China has very little debt. And they, I think, are about to go borrow a bunch of money and stimulate like crazy because their sort of Faustian bargain is we give you jobs and we take all of your liberty. And I guess I'm never going to China again, but they, you know, throw anyone that complains or whatever in concentration camps and engage in genocide, all kinds of other sort of terrible stuff. So that's that's the Faustian deal. And so they know if they break the deal, they have to either throw like 100 million people in jail and maybe kill a bunch of them or uh, they're going to get killed themselves. And they, they generally seem to not be interested. They built all these like COVID concentration camps. They didn't actually throw that many people in them. And they, I think they sort of have made the decision that they're going to go re-stimulate their economy. And I know it sounds sort of terrible the way I was describing it, but it's really, I mean, I've been there. It was a really rough place, really. You meet the people that are successful there and they've sort of struggled through just just horrible, I mean, all of the worst things you can think of in terms of the ways that societies and um, governments and whatever are run and economies are run. And they, they've sort of struggled through it and they have, there's really interesting companies and really successful people there. And, you know, I think, so that's sort of a, a ramble, but the, the short of it is, I think they'll be able to squeeze another big spout of growth. And then that's probably it. That's probably like their, their upside case is a Japan type scenario, let's say a couple years from now, where you have sort of stagnant growth. But the nice thing from an oil perspective is that they're still at this spot in the S curve where their economy, they could actually experience, and they're probably experiencing right now negative GDP, but positive oil demand because you know you have fewer buildings that are built for housing that isn't needed, but you have more, let's say, gasoline powered cars and scooters that are bought and then, you know, with sort of stable oil consumption associated with those and plastics bought by people who are a little wealthier than they were. And so you're on that nice spot in the sort of demographic S curve where you have room for, I mean, in theory, if Chinese people were to get to a quality of life that we enjoy here in America or that's enjoyed, um, you know, in Europe or wherever, I mean, you, you would have them using about 40 million barrels a day or something. I mean, they're not getting to that. Um, which is unfortunate for those poor people there. But, you know, there's still there's a whole set of people that are upping their, you know, their individual oil consumption by a very small amount. So it's actually not that oil price sensitive in terms of that consumption, um, but it's dispersed enough that and there's enough people there that, you know, you have a few hundred million people using incrementally a tiny amount more of oil and you're talking about uh, just enormous increase in consumption uh, on a daily basis. So do we, do we sort of peak there at 17 or 18 or something million barrels a day and then have some real issues or whatever? Sure. But from a current oil market perspective, you know, China is doing what you'd need it to do to be able to have a pretty strong oil market. And I think we're not seeing that with price, but we are seeing that with volumes and inventories. And, you know, again, I think really this, uh, this setup right now is showing who's sort of price driven, who's the technical trader and the, you know, getting their information from price movements in the market and who's doing their fundamental research and actually tracking consumption and supply, which are mostly knowable variables. So um, long answer to a short question, but trying to sort of right now muddling through it, I don't, I'm not a believer long term in their economic model. I think almost <laughs> very few people are at this point. And it's just a question of, hey, like, how does this how does this end? Where does this go? And almost any of those uh, paths lead to a reasonably high level of oil consumption in China, even with less sort of bridge to nowhere construction and fewer ghost cities getting built or anything like that. 
And then again, like if you think about timing some sort of collapse or whatever, the the federal government ability, and you know, I'm probably saying that wrong, the central government's ability to put on significant debt here. And there, there are enormous positive trade balances, which everyone sort of forgets when they're all bearish on China. I mean, <laughs> they have enormous inflows. And again, they have lots of problems. They need to use that money for stuff, but they also have a lot of money coming in. Um, you know, they're on the right side of things from a trade balance perspective. And so, you know, I, I just I see more oil consumption there for the relevant period that's forecastable. And we are seeing that right now. And I guess the reason to talk about the ability for the central government to be able to borrow money to re-stimulate is that you're on this sort of painful, um, low manufacturing level, low construction level, higher personal consumption oil traje- consumption trajectory. But if they do successfully re-stimulate, you can get another two or three million barrels a day of demand. I don't know how sticky it'll be, but you could be you could see this real boost that would be sort of, um, I guess the right way to think about it would be the Chinese uh, oil consumption growth that we saw in 2007 and 2008, where you just surprise up and I don't know. I, I don't see anyone talking about it. And it's, I think, I think the more likely tail risk, given the negative repercussions for the people making the decisions um, for China is the right tail risk from an oil consumption perspective and not the left tail risk. Very comprehensive breakdown. And we love long answers on this show. Please can continue with them. Um, you know, I wanted to maybe get off topic a little for, from just strictly, you know, oil supply demand and touch on some comments you made regarding the collapse of First Republic Bank. Namely, their over-the-top ESG policies that stop them from doing any business with companies, quote, operating in environmentally sensitive industries. So do you think this could be part of the reason for their failure? And if so, do you think this might wake up other financial institutions to not make the same mistakes? I mean, we've already seen some big institutional funds kind of step back on their ESG commitments. Um, Is is this something that you think people are going to realize does more harm than good in the end? So... My friend uh, Harris Kupperman, he likes to say that ESG dies with 4% or higher interest rates. And so, you know, there's a lot that you can say about it. But I think the simplest thing is that ESG is a combination of grift with virtue signaling and violation of sort of uh, or, or like it's exemplary of the principal agent problem. And so, you know, the principal agent problem is that you have what one would do if it were their thing, and then what one would do if they're the paid manager of someone else's thing. And, you know, you just think about it, like, how do you treat your house versus how do you treat the apartment that you're renting? And you think about the incentives and they're very different. And so you have these People who, whether they're running a European energy company that used to be an oil company and they want to attend the right parties or whatever, or keep their jobs, um, you have uh, asset managers with similar sorts of things where they realize, hey, I can basically run an index fund, but I can charge five times the going rate for it if I call it something else. Um, you have environmental groups that have missed on every forecast they've made for decades and every doom thing is wrong. So they, you know, push on things a different way. There's many different facets of this, but it all sort of comes into this thing. And then the really crazy thing is that many of these companies, they, they, they're, they're sort of, they're internally contradictory. And so, you know, people say, oh, well, you invest in oil, therefore, and it's like, no, I invest in oil because I think that the companies I'm investing in are making the world and humanity better. And that by providing relatively clean hydrocarbons that, you know, burn clean, that don't spill in the rainforest and don't, you know, force child labor in uh, to mine cobalt or whatever in Central Africa and cut kids' arms off and engage in slavery and all kinds of other terrible stuff and don't do X, you know, don't kill a bunch of whales through these offshore wind farms. You know, there's a lot, a lot of considerations, but there's a reality, which is that you can actually do quite well. Uh, while doing good from an energy perspective, it's just not usually whatever the in thing is, is wrong and sort of problematic. And so we have this thing that got really, really popular and it got popular because of the grift associated with it, the ability to charge extra returns and because of the inclination for people generally to misbehave with other people's stuff. And so, um, you know, how much did that happen at First Republic? I'd say actually Silicon Valley Bank was much worse with that. I mean, they were off the charts, 
off the charts virtue signaling. You know, I got a lot of flack for posting stuff on Twitter about Silicon Valley Bank. And it was from people who had celebrated the crash of oil prices, celebrated layoffs, had joked about how, not joked even, talked about how people that drilled for oil that helped you know, drill for gas and produce the energy that's used for their startups. They had celebrated their layoffs and joked about how they should, uh, you know, learn to code. And, you know, it's horrible, right? These guys, they had a bank with no risk manager for a year. And then, but they did have a junior risk manager in one of their foreign subsidiaries who was really focused on the diversity and whatever initiatives. And, you know, <laughs> they went bankrupt for a failure of risk management, but don't worry, they attended lots of DEI summits and they were a leader in hiring, you know, X, Y, or Z categories of people. But, you know, so I think, I think, yeah, I think it's a sort of cultural thing. I don't think specifically not lending to oil companies or whatever killed First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank, but I think that this sort of bizarre culture of stakeholder whatever or ESG or whatever, it's just it's just BS and everyone knows it when it really comes down to it. no one wants to put their personal money and that sort of thing. You didn't see the venture capitalists who told everyone to learn to code going and personally bailing out. So, you know, they whined and got my money and your money and everyone else's money to go pay for it to bail out this bank that they had, you know, profiteered from. Um, but, you know, you don't, you don't get, um, you know, you don't get them doing that with their money. <laughs> they, they, they go and, you know, invest in things that are real where there's people that actually care about the stuff that, that's going on. So it's sort of, it's this really weird, unfortunate thing. And so I guess it's more of a, it's more of a symptom of sort of, a, you know, it's the Gordon Gecko thing, right? Like greed is good. Economics really indicates that there is scarcity of stuff. And when there's scarcity, you want to focus on the things that are scarce. And the way we measure that in a capitalist society, which is not perfect, but it's more perfect than communism and fascism and various other sort of you know options for economic systems, and much more perfect than socialism, which you know is a huge cause of death worldwide through genocide and you know death camps in Russia and various other things, um, and and in the modern world in China and uh, various other you know various other countries, um, you know I think. I think there's a real issue if you try to focus on anything else other than just doing whatever you can to contribute to the world. And our system, which again is imperfect, but better than all the other ones, um, rewards people for best serving others. And that's measured through monetary profits. And when you have institutions like banks that are you know, federally insured and they're sort of quasi quasi private, but also have a public aspect where they're distracted by these non- non-service items, right? They pretend like it's service, but the way you measure the service is profits. And when they have these other things going on, um, they're distracting. And so they're just not good at what they're doing. And uh, the main job for a bank is risk management, right? Secondarily, they're lending and then, you know, they should be good people and like not mistreat people and not be racist or, you know, preferentially hire people because of their skin color or gender or anything like that. They should definitely not discriminate. Ironically, they end up discriminating because of these things, but they should be good while doing this, but they should ultimately you know, deliver profits. And so these are institutions that were very proud of these other focuses. So again, did any of the specific focuses hurt them? No, but, you know, certainly, I mean, you know, the, it's not, it's not a surprise that these firms that were sort of on the, the bleeding edge of, you know, the ESG movement, um, didn't have risk managers and blew up as soon as interest rates moved, which was not, I mean, again, it wasn't like anyone in particular was so great about knowing that interest rates were going to rip higher. You don't really see stories about people that earned excess profits from, um, you know, this interest rate move. But, you know, you do see the people that were supposed to know it, which are banks, you know, again, they don't know when it happens, but they sort of, the tide went out and they weren't wearing shorts, but they were, you know, <laughs> top rated ESG with the best attendance for DEI. And again, I think the best ex example of that is Silicon Valley Bank, the sort of extreme virtue signaling and no risk manager. Yeah, very well said. Um, I want to switch back to oil and gas and talk about that you said you think more M&A activity is likely coming in the oil industry and that that will in turn likely lead to higher prices up ahead. So could you expand on that for us and let us know what you're seeing there? Yeah, I mean, there was a deal that was announced last night. Um, there's just been a ton of, a ton of activity. 
Um, what's been happening is companies are running out of their development inventory to be able to drill new wells. And they are um, getting worse returns on investment from developing. So they're going and buying additional assets and additional fields. And the fields they're buying typically have production that's been juiced. So the, you know, if there's 10 years of inventory life, if you ran one rig on an asset, you might run three and then get your production way higher than sort of a reasonable steady state and then resell it to someone that's buying it from you for a pretty high price because you base the price on the production that you got to at that moment that you're selling. And you know, everyone sort of understands this and, and the prices aren't egregious yet, but they're sort of headed in that direction. And so one of the things that you do after you buy an asset like this, if you're you know, a public company and you're not blowing your brains out with this sort of aggressive growth that you're going to run out of anyway, right? Because you're buying assets because you don't have enough drilling inventory and because you don't have good exploration prospects. So what you do is you go and buy it. Uh, the recent deal, it's unclear exactly what the drilling activity will look like. Maybe they're going from one rig to zero or one rig to a rig that's half the time spent on that asset. But this uh, recent deal that wasn't yesterday, it was a few weeks ago, um, where Aventive, a formerly Canadian, it used to be NCAP, they, they rebranded to sound like a, a drug company or something. Um, they uh, spent billions of dollars to buy a few companies in West Texas that were all owned by one uh, private, equity firm, private equity firm. And they... Um, they took it from essentially seven rigs, that was the claim to two. So, you know, that sort of drop after the sort of egregious ramp up in that activity with super high decline rates, um, the idea is to basically take it from growing 50% a year to flat. And as you do more and more of these deals, you're sort of absorbing remaining development inventory into larger entities that have limited inventory and that go from that sort of seven rigs to two or one to half and so on. So I think... I think that sort of dynamic is limiting growth, but there's also another aspect of that, which is important. And it's a big part of why these deals are happening, which is that the buyers are running out of inventory. So there would be this slowdown sort of anyway. And one of the things that you're seeing is just the shift from more aggressive developers to slower developers. And so that is sort of moderating the shift. The nice thing about it, I think from an overall supply perspective is that this sort of like run and then stop uh, plan is is terrible because it risks there being a stop in a supply of a globally necessary commodity. And so having producers that have sort of more steady production is, I think, better holistically from a, a U.S. and sort of global supply perspective. And so I think I think it's sort of a healthy thing for these assets to get bought. Hopefully you don't get bought for too high a price. And the flip side is I love buying stocks of companies that traded a fraction of the value of where these private assets are transacting because, you know, eventually I think there's going to be some premium publicly traded buyouts. And you know, we did the math on this recent one and there's somewhere between 100 and 200 percent premium that's implied relative to the current price of one of our companies in the area. Uh, the last one, there was a 200 percent premium implied. So great. So we sort of bracket it 100% to 200% upside from the current transaction value and the trajectory for these transaction values is up. So, you know, again, good for the oil price, maybe great from a supply stability perspective and wonderful in terms of validating our underwriting on some of these public companies where these private transactions of size, right, of a size that's relevant relative to these uh, publicly traded companies, um, yeah, you know, they're they're happening and uh, they're happening at valuations that makes me feel real excited to go buy more of these stocks. Do you take a look at the oil tanker sector at all? This is a, a sector that seems to be very under discussed, except for in the darkest corners of FinTwit, and um, it it does seem to prevent to present an attractive um, value proposition, at least based on the limited amount of, of DD that I've done into the sector. It seems that the fundamentals are bullish. What what are your thoughts there? Is that something that you look at or, or do you stick more to the um, explorers and producers? I mean, I look at companies across the energy value chain. And so um, I have looked at them extensively. I've owned uh, oil tankers and product tankers before. I don't own them right now. Um, I think there's a real risk. So there's been some reporting of some cheating by Russia on their recent voluntary OPEC plus quota cut, which is sort of bizarre, but that's sort of been one of the explanations for the recent oil price sell-off in addition to the bank run concerns and economic concerns. And so even with that, it does look like the UAE is following through. There's some initial data on that, that they're following through with their commitment to cut. 
And it looks likely that Saudi is going to do that. They have a good history of following through on their cuts. And so I think, um, I think we're going to see actually oil volumes shipped fall a little. And, you know, it, it's sort of this weird question where for people who are not bullish oil prices, I don't really understand how they expect the market to clear if right now <laughs> oil is going out of storage, right? It's coming from storage and getting delivered to China and India where it's getting processed and consumed and, and, and other places in the world. Right? But it's easy to talk about those because they're sort of the big incremental consumers of it. And so we're, we're talking about there. So the oil is already coming out of storage and going to those places and getting used. And now we're talking about the sources of that oil in addition to the storage reducing their supply. When you think about it like that, it gets even more interesting. It's like, wait a second, there's probably another million barrels a day coming offline and we were already dipping into storage and storage levels are pretty low relative to where they've been historically and they've been falling pretty fast. And th this is even before the summer kicks off, before additional sort of summer travel and you know extra mobility. It's, you know, Chinese international flights are picking up and whether you use, I mean, I kind of hope that FT is right and that China international flights are only at 20% and not you know, 66%, right? I'd like them to be right and me and these data sources I've used be wrong because then there's even more upside. But either way, there's going to be more international travel from China. Um, the U.S. finally were dropping our ridiculous uh, COVID travel bans and requirements and stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, various other countries that were very onerous with that have dropped those as well, like Canada. And so, uh, and in various European countries. And so um, I think I think we're going to see incremental demand, but there's just this problem, which is where is the oil supposed to come from? So uh, when you think about tankers, the problem is there's going to be less oil coming from these various places. It's not coming from the U.S. We're not growing that much. We're growing a little, but not a lot. Um, our consumption is growing. So we're not really, I mean, I know we import and export oil, but we're not really like helping that so much. So I don't know the answer to where the oil is going to come from, which is why I'm so bullish for oil, but I know that there's going to be less of it. And so if I'm looking at the companies that are shipping it, that makes me a little less excited about it because, you know, if there's 99 of the thing instead of 100 of the thing and the pricing is set on the margin for these shippers of the thing, um, I, I'm probably less excited about the shippers of it and I'm more excited about the producers of it. So I know it's a very sort of simplistic way to think about it. I'm aware there are some that are traded at larger discounts to book value or replacement cost or are cheap on cash flow or whatever. And you know, those are all important metrics and I follow them. I just, I think I would rather, to the extent I was going to own those, own them at a point where it looks like there are some tailwinds and it looks like there are some significant headwinds. And I don't think, I don't think they're really as cheap as they look. And so I'm not really willing to go jump in front of that wave or truck or whatever um, to, uh, to go buy those stocks here. I wanted to hone in on natural gas now, because once again, a lot of the talk in the oil and gas industry focuses on oil and, and not a lot on natural gas. Um, we saw a dramatic fall in prices from its peak at over $9 in August of 2022, all the way down to around $2 and change where it's, it's hovering around today. Now, natural gas itself is known as a widow maker trade, but do, do you think there might be an opportunity in the sector at these prices, whether trading the actual commodity itself or um, with the equities? So, so natural gas producers that are focused on natural gas are pricing in, it looks like, a little higher natural gas than the current price. So I'm not that interested in sort of dry gas producers because if they have an implied 350 or 450 um, price in their equity, um, you know, if you build sort of a discounted cash flow model or look at analyst models and uh, look at sort of the implied price, they're, they're just they're, they're pricing in a higher price than the current price for natural gas, and the forward curve is pricing in a higher price than the current price for natural gas. So I don't really like either of those as a way to get that exposure, and I'm not really that bullish on natural gas right this second. I think. Over time, there's going to be additional uh, LNG facilities that get built here in the U.S. and in Canada, and they should help sort of stabilize the, the price and maybe get the U.S. and Canadian price closer to the international price, minus a really significant premium for the shipping and paying the terminals and stuff to get the gas overseas. Um, but I think 
I think there's just a better way to play it. And the way I'm playing it is through uh, oil producers that also have some gas production. And the interesting thing is that, especially on the smaller side, you have producers that are pricing in $2 or 250 natural gas. So where, and maybe like 50 or $55 oil or something like that. So where you used to have to, or where you would have to pay $4 in MCF implied to buy a dry gas producer equity, you just buy an oil producer equity that has a lot of natural gas production and get that gas exposure very, very cheap. So I prefer the oil exposure anyway. And then through a number of my positions, I just have this extra essentially exposure to upside in natural gas that essentially from my perspective is free. So I like the exposure. I'm happy to have it here, but I'm not that interested in having a, a base level valuation at $4 in MCF or something like that when the price is at two and change. And again, not that I think that the price is right for the medium term. It, I'm, I'm actually not sure exactly where gas goes in the short term. And there is an oversupply currently until some of these LNG facilities come on. Um, but you know, I think, I think there is an opportunity there. It's just not where people are looking. So you noted in your newsletter from Bison Interest that small cap oil and gas stocks offer a particularly compelling value proposition at the moment. Could you break that down for us and also outline the risks involved in investing in the smaller cap space versus the big producers for those who maybe um, aren't so familiar with the industry? Yeah, so we're, we're living in sort of like peak uh, indexing, the peak passive investing. And so with the flood of money into uh, S&P 500 indexes, which is sort of the, the most popular um, bracket of those, you're seeing the large cap stocks, especially the mega cap oil and gas stocks, get bid up significantly, particularly the US ones. And so when you look at the valuation for an Exxon or Chevron, again, excellent businesses, very well run. They've navigated things very well, I think, considering all the ESG pressures and other sort of nonsense that they're subject to. Um, but when you look at sort of how they're valued and what they're pricing in, I mean, you sort of, they're, they're at roughly fair value to maybe even a little bit expensive. Uh, you know, you look at the EBITDA multiples and so, I mean, seven, eight, nine times, depending on the exact oil price assumptions, especially given the down move in refining margins recently, uh, which is another one of those sectors that was everyone loved. And it's like, wait a second, like uh, there's not like do the math here, especially with OPEC cuts, especially with sort of supply struggles, even if demand isn't that great, refining still doesn't look that good. There's an over oversupply of refiners. Uh, we got sort of uh, caught short after COVID because there was extra maintenance necessary and there had been a slowdown in new construction and a few refiners had gotten shut down that were, you know, they were supposed to coincide with new construction. And so we sort of got off on that and you ended up with a, a weird sort of surge in refining margins and that's come down a lot. And so in that context, these stocks actually look reasonably priced to quite expensive on the large side. And I think part of what's been driving that is just index flows. So you look at an Exxon of the world versus look at a XYZ small cap at two times EBITDA or something like that. And you know, of the businesses that Exxon's in, and again, not to, they're well run and it's a great company. It's just, you know, it's not a, not a cheap stock in my opinion. Um, they, uh, you know, the, the best business within Exxon at the moment, I think is the uh, oil production. And so I can go buy that best business within that sort of set. I mean, arguably, maybe some of the chemicals is interesting, but you know, main main earnings drivers. I think I think their oil production is really interesting, and I can go buy essentially their oil production elsewhere in a much smaller sort of uh, frame or envelope or whatever, um, and buy it at two times or three times instead of paying seven or nine or whatever. And so I think just really simply, that's the upside. The downside is that. Exxon can borrow money at any time if they want for now. And, you know, they can't borrow that much, but they can borrow relative to their size of business, but they can go borrow money. So their, um, their availability of liquidity in a down market is a lot better than small cap producers, which is part of why they've tended to trade better. I mean, they did pretty poorly during COVID, which was unusual, um, but they also had problems during COVID and, uh, you know, Chevron and others did too, that, that were unusual for them relative to other other downturns. So it sort of challenged their business model, that, that sort of shutdown. So generally they don't trade down that much in downturns. They don't trade up that much in up markets. We're in this sort of weird bubble for large cap stocks with everyone deciding it's risk-free to go own ETFs. 
And um, you know, again, like thinking about like where do people put their money? <laughs> a lot of people have their money in these low cost ETFs and they think oh, I'm indexing, so I'm fine. And it's like, well, what are you actually paying for and getting with this stuff? And so um, I think that's uh, that's driven high uh, large cap valuations. The nice thing about it is that it's become very economic for those producers and for those integrated companies to go buy assets and buy companies instead of buying back shares. And it, even if you look at it on sort of a dividend basis, even if their business in life now is just forget buybacks, it's just to pay the highest possible dividend. If they go and spend a dollar on buying an asset and it lets them bump their dividend by X percent, right? People don't really care that much if they're not borrowing money, if they're just using cash on hand. I think they, they do better by increasing their ability to deliver a higher sustainable dividend than they do by in trying to increase their dividend, their like payout ratio, or then reinvesting in their asset base if they have limited reinvestment opportunities. So you're sort of pushing buyouts, pushing acquisitions through this re-rate of the larger cap equities. And you know, I think that's part of why there's been this buyout boom, in addition to this sort of scarce, uh, scarce remaining inventory. And I think it makes this sort of small cap space a little safer than you'd think otherwise. The other thing that makes it safer, and again, it's very risky. These stocks are very volatile, which is part of why I think so few people actually invest in them professionally in size, because it's very scary to have stocks you own professionally for your clients um, down a lot any given day or week or month or year. And there's just the trade off is you can do really well with them. And the fewer people that want to buy them as professional investors, the less research is being done on them, the more alpha is available through selecting the right ones. Um, so again, it's sort of this weird setup where the, the less popular it is, the more likely you are to do well in it, all things being equal. And, uh, you know, the other big risk is that these companies, many of them got close to going bankrupt during COVID, but almost all of them are way better businesses. Even the ones that haven't paid off almost all their debt have way more production, way more reserves, way more whatever. So, you know, they're just better than they were. They survived COVID. They cut their costs. They're, um, be you know, better positioned on many, many different fronts. And so... You know, they look really risky when you look at the historical stock price, like where did it bottom in 2020? And I think that's a hard thing for people to get over that you're not paying 2020 prices anymore for these equities, but you're also, I think, not taking 2020 risk anymore with those equities. And then the businesses have improved a lot. So it's sort of this hard thing to calibrate. And then I guess just the last thing is um, it's very difficult to find low decline oil production in large cap producers. It's just not common. And the history is that low decline production used to sell for very, very high valuations. And right now you can still buy low decline producers, partly because their operating costs are a little higher, partly because maybe they're more likely to have a little more debt. You can buy low decline producers um, for 20,000 or 30,000 or whatever a flowing barrel when at the peak in 2014, these assets would transact for 200 or $250,000 per flowing barrel. And it's pretty remarkable to be able to buy those. I mean, even if you pay 50,000 a flowing barrel for a low decline, you know, uh, that's the dollar amount per barrel of oil produced per day by the producer. Typically, uh, the way I'm doing it is implied in the, you know, you look at the total market capitalization and enterprise value of the business, and you, know, you divide that by the number of barrels they're producing. And you, know, you look at these low decline producers, especially in the public market, I mean, they're really, they're available for just remarkably cheap prices. And yeah, the stocks were lower during COVID, but right now, I mean, you look at the risks for oil, it's not, there's almost no chance oil goes to zero again through a, a recession or whatever. That happened through government shutdowns that shut down tens of millions of barrels a day of demand forcibly. We're still in recovery from that, right? We haven't even gotten back to pre-COVID demand levels. So we're still in a, a rebound, but everyone always thinks that this next thing that will happen, they worry about the most recent one. And so you know, when you think about it, the, the risk from a downside price perspective is, is mitigated to some extent. And the upside is that you eventually get into a situation where oil is viewed as scarce and there's capital back in the sector and you get to valuations like this $200,000 or $250,000 a barrel a day for low decline production, likely in a higher price environment. But And there's various factors like higher, higher oil field services costs and other factors that would go into that sort of higher valuation for low decline production. But the uplift 
available is enormous and you can't really get it. You know, you go buy a Pioneer or a Devon or whatever, or a Diamondback, you're getting a 30% plus decline rate. You're getting all these other challenges. You're really exposed to oil field service costs. And there's not really a, even a path for those guys. It'd be really hard for them to get down to an ultra low decline rate. So just the, the intrinsic value of their assets is lower because you know, you're just, you're having to spend so much money to replace the production when it naturally declines as it declines naturally 30% a year. So you're growing 30% just to stay flat. You're reinvesting to have to do that. Um, so yeah, so these low decline producers, super interesting. It's very weird to me that they haven't really traded up anywhere close to where they got. I mean, we're sort of at, when you look at the the trough valuations in 2008 for low decline producers, we're sort of, <laughs> here we are after this post COVID run, a lot of them are trading around the lowest levels they got to in 2009 and like March of 2009 when people thought the world was ending, they were trading around there for that sort of values and the, the steals that people were so excited about in the private market. I don't think they even got to buy assets for as cheap as they are right now for low decline production on a per barrel basis, even at the lowest point in 2009. So I think it's like, it's not 2020, but it's still really cheap and it still looks like there's huge upside. And the nice thing is it's so cheap that there will be lots of share price volatility, but there's also a lot of safety and there's a lot of downside protection from the low valuations, from the cost structures being reduced, from the debt pay down. So that's where it's just so interesting. And then again, if you just do it from a charts perspective, I'm not really a technical analyst or anything like that, but you look at... PSCE down 65% and XOP up like 30% since 2015. It's even sort of more extreme from 2014. And the broader stock market, sorry, up, you know, 100% or so since, since that time. Um, you know, there's a lot of room for XOP to catch up. XLE is basically almost fully caught up. So the Exxons and Chevrons sort of back to peak levels. And I think they might even be at all-time highs, the, those stocks. And PSE down 64%. It's like, okay, well, you know, is Exxon wrong or are people mispricing these small caps? And it's way more likely, again, when I say it's expensive, yeah, maybe it's like 10% expensive, but it's probably like the right valuation. It's that these small caps are so ridiculously cheap and there's just so many different preferences that are baked into how ultra cheap they are versus the fair valuations on some of these larger producers. So that's where it just gets so interesting to me and where, you know, generally the small caps are interesting. There's more risk on an individual basis. So I think it requires more work, but as a basket, the small cap producers are really cheap. The small services stocks are really cheap. And on an individual basis, there are things that are just, it's just ridiculous how cheap some of these things are on a one-off basis where you can find ones that own a power plant or own a bunch of pipelines or own, you know, real estate or whatever. <laughs> and you're paying almost nothing for the oil production. Uh, you know, there's a few where there's sort of the, the value framework, good co, bad co set up where you have a rapidly growing power gen business or something. And you get the, you know, over the next three years, if they just continue on their current trajectory, you get their like oil production for free or something. So, you know, there's, it's just ridiculous in terms of how great some of these values are, but there's also this overlying or there's sort of general overlay where they're very structurally cheap for a reason. And that reason is likely to change through buyouts. It's likely to change through fund flows. It's likely to change as sort of the market continues its market cycle and as oil and gas continues on this sort of undersupply, ultimately leading to higher prices. And the nice part is it kind of doesn't matter how it works out, whether these companies get bought out, whether they just pay down all their debt and buy back a bunch of stock and pay large dividends, whether they get bigger through mergers and end up getting repriced through the indexes. I kind of don't really care. It doesn't really matter how they get repriced. It just matters that there's this sort of gravity holds and there's this inexorable pull right now on these ultra low valuation businesses um, to fair value, which is much higher than where they're trading. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. So much knowledge shared in this sector, which I think is very under discussed. And it's, it's kind of a niche sector that I think a lot of people are starting to gain interest in. So we really appreciate your perspective. Um, for those who want to learn more, could you fill us in on Bison Interest and anywhere you'd like to direct people online? Yeah, sure. So, so um, 
Bison, um, we're, Bison Interest is an investment advisor and we advise a, a strategy. Um, and none of this is solicitation or recommendation or anything like that. But, um, you know, and, and we're sort of the way we're set up, it's a, a private strategy. So, you know, it's only relevant for qualified accredited investors. We did launch an offshore fund, which was was exciting recently. Um, so we, we used to um, that used to not be so relevant for for offshore investors. And, um, you know, if people are interested, they're welcome to reach out again. We're not asking you for money or anything like that. But if it's relevant, you're, you're welcome to. And so our website's bisoninterests.com. And then um, there's a contact us thing there. And then you can find us also, we have a, a monthly sort of newsletter where we've been, you know, we'll sometimes put out big macro pieces um, and sometimes just sort of a shorter oil market update or a stock update in terms of how we're doing and what we're seeing in the market. And uh, we're also on Twitter at Bison Interests, or you can find me, just look up Josh Young on Twitter. Great, I'll put links to all that in the description below. Thank you once again for joining us and looking forward to having another update sometime later in the future. Thanks a lot. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.